Welcome back to the show, everyone. I am joined by my very good friend, not even a special guest. He is a very good friend of mine, Mr. Michael Rollins. How are you doing today, Mike? I mean, look, dude, it's freaking tsunami outside. Uh, we've got kids it in the house. It is a very it's bad day outside. So bad. Yeah. Look, I woke up to thunderstorms this morning, which just makes you want to sleep longer. Me too. Right? Like, yeah. It, so in that way, it was pretty fantastic. But honestly, man, I'm, uh, we're doing all right. We're living the dream. You have the same problem I have because uh -huh. you were the original shed quarters, right? Uh -huh. I was. Yes, and I was. I, and I, I didn't get the idea from you, but mm -hmm. I realized, oh, there's a community of us now yeah. of people who have well, sheds in their backyard and backyard offices. This, and this was pre-pandemic. Yeah. Right? Like, it's so funny because I feel like when the pandemic hit, I mean, obviously the pandemic was really awful in a lot of ways, but one of the things that made me chuckle was watching all of my colleagues try to figure out how to work from home. Yeah. And you know, I'd, I'd see people get like the haggard look around their eyes and I'd be like, come on, let's talk. And I'd be like, are you working in your bedroom? And they'd be like, yeah, there's yeah. nowhere else I can work. And I'm like, you probably should change. That. I would even tell people, I'm like, just don't be in your bedroom for 18 hours yeah day. so it's a separation of it concerns is. it is you know, let's bring programming into this yep. don't take work into the bedroom because the bedroom's for other things right it is. and um most importantly sleeping it's I also why some folks they don't put it but TV. i take your point yeah it's not the most important but if you're a single person maybe maybe okay yeah, this yeah, is true yeah, this yeah. is true yeah. yeah all right but like your your bedroom is a sacred place. Like don't it work is. in your sacred place because then you're going to regret being in your sacred place. Mm -hmm. And we've had this conversation multiple times. Like the shed quarters is really good for that separation. When I come out here to work, I'm you're in working. work mode. When I go into the house, I'm in, I'm not in work mode. I'm in dad mode. I'm in husband yep. mode. Yep. And it's nice to have that concern, that, that separation of concerns. It is. Um, Absolutely. Where it's more particularly a problem is a day like today where it's a tsunami outside God. and we, I had to put on a rain jacket. I did too. My office. I had to put on a hat and a rain jacket and then I had to step carefully yeah. through the lawn so I could avoid all of the, you know, same thing, four inch deep puddles. <laughs> it was pretty yep. great. I, I don't know about you. I should really take a picture. I've worn a path mm -hmm. in my oh, yeah. backyard just from years and years of walking. Mm -hmm. And it's created a divot in mm -hmm. the backyard that I should really fill. I should like, I should pave a walkway yes, for myself. I, because I think this every time it rains. Yes. You are not yeah, the only one. A great idea. And then uh, what I've done is accidentally expanded the pathway because I've realized all the grass is dead in the middle. So I've started walking on the outskirts, yeah. but that actually doesn't let the grass grow in the middle. So I'm just expanding this, this dead spot across the middle of my yard. It's, it's pretty fantastic. Mike, tell us a little bit about what are you currently working on? So I know you, yeah. but our audience might not know you. So um, let me uh, let me start with a little bit of backstory. Um, I had my midlife crisis, you know, the same time most dudes do. Um, you know, I've been working for 20 some years and decided I was really bored with it. And so I decided to go off and try to make millions as a YouTuber. And as it turns out, I made hundreds. Um, <laughs> Still better which, than which was, nothing, Which right? is fantastic. Yeah. Um, but when I, when I did that, I realized actually how incredibly hard it is to be a successful creator. Um, but it's also the first time I ever looked at myself as a business, as opposed to just this dude, Mike Rollins, who's somebody's employee. Um, eventually I did realize that like, no, I do love coding. It's what I have done for the, my entire professional career and I still enjoy it. And, um, I think there was this day where I was just thinking and I was like, what would 20 year old Mike think about 40 year old Mike. And I was like, actually, I think 20 year old Mike would think 40 year old Mike's kind of a badass. And that really, that was a good thought. Let me go back into like this thing that I can do. It does make a, a very good living. Um, then, you know, career or, or job changes last year in July, I got laid off and, um, it was shocking. Um, it was in no way, shape or form unique. And, um, we were in a position to make the best of it. And what I mean by that is, um, 
we had cleared out all of our debt except for the house. We had what we thought was three months of savings built up. And um, so when my when I lost my job and there was a teeny bit of severance, which was nice, um, it was not immediately all hands on deck. I have to have another job in two weeks. Um, it was a, that last job had, it had been a bit of a slog. And so I was able to kind of chill for a couple weeks just to catch my breath and then decide what I wanted to do next. And the thing I wanted to do next was try to work for myself. Um, which then leads me to where I am now. I'm working for, or trying to found this company called Engine Room Media. Um, my co-founders are all actually Hollywood types. Um, our CEO, uh, has executive produced a bunch of stuff for Paramount. Um, our COO is, was, uh, the president of this little record label called Def Jam Records from 90 to 95. Um, you know, these guys are a little startup, little, yeah. little, little teeny <laughs> thing had a minor impact on modern culture. Um, and then our, our CFO is from, you know, uh, he's from wall street and you know, the, the, I don't understand why they let me in the room, but so be it. Um, but they try and they actually intended to bring like a studio model to podcasting and creators. And they found out that didn't work for a lot of different reasons. Um, but in the process, they figured out how to help creators become better businesses. And so, um, an example I can give you from recent times is, um, I was speaking with a friend of mine who's creator from, you know, my YouTube days and the guy's just incredibly sophisticated for, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. And I asked him, I said, what's your lifetime value for a patron on Patreon? And he just stopped. He was like, I have no idea. And I don't even know how to answer that. I don't even know how to find the answer. And, you know, I said, okay, well, have you ever thought about backing out what the cost of acquisition is for a patron? He was like, I've never even thought of it. These are actually relatively simple business metrics, but it is yeah. not most people, most creators don't start a creator business. Well, first off, most creators don't know that they're starting a business. And even if they get to the point where they figure out that they started a business, they don't realize that they're like, they're really good at creating that, but they may not be good at business. And so the, the purpose of engineering media is to capture data and information that the creator provides us cross platform, not just verticals, not YouTube and Facebook or whatever, like it's across everything and begin to give them recommendations that help them improve their business fundamentals. Most of these people have, you know, we're our target audience is a creator that makes between a hundred thousand a year, well, maybe even 50,000 a year and, um, you know, a million or two a year. Um, and what we found is in that range, you've got people with like, they've got the, the thing that has made them special, if you will. Um, and, but now they're like, a little bit like overweight athletes sometimes where if you start tightening up a few nuts and bolts here, they become, um, their, their, their business skyrockets and it does so quickly and it's really cool to see. Um, so I'm building the software for that. Um, it's still early days. I mean, it's a wild environment yeah. to be raising money. Um, but it is also like very gratifying and very exciting. The folks that you have as co-founders, how did you get hooked up with those guys? Because that's a, that is that's quite a, a skill set yeah. to, to get into one room. How did you make that initial connection or how did they make the connection with you? Um, so uh, it actually came through one of my, my former CEOs, a guy named Sean Burns. Um, and I worked for Sean at both Flurry and Outlier. And um, they got connected to Sean through one of his business partners. And, um, you know, they, what was interesting is Sean's group looked at engine room was like, Hey, you guys have a SaaS platform. You just haven't written the code yet. Yeah. And so, um, Sean was like, who do I know that's a good engineer and understands the creator economy and might be available? Oh, there's this guy, Mike Rollins. Hey Mike, are you interested in this? And I'm like, oh my God, yes, this is amazing. Um. And so, I mean, you know, it, it, 
I will say this. One of the things I've learned um, over the past few years is I did a lot of really good networking and didn't under, didn't realize I had done it. And part of the reason, part of that networking was basically just caring for people and taking care of them, you know, making, going to your coworker and saying, Hey, is everything all right? How are you doing? Or yeah. celebrating their wins. Right. Like it turns out just being a nice person and I'm, I don't, you know, I'm not like a paragon of niceness here. Uh, I could be kind of a jerk sometimes too. I'll tell you, <laughs> but it, it's interesting that, that being polite and kind and taking an interest in people is a fantastic way to co to um to network so. it's all about building bricks right like it's about you, relationships uh, you know you set a yeah you yeah. create this network and it's one person at a time mm -hmm. and you really never realize that a connection or a relationship that you've created 10 years ago oh, yeah. might come back to help you in the future absolutely um I've had that more than once where someone actually, I have a similar, similar story mm -hmm. where a couple of months ago, a guy I used to work for, oh, what year is it? 2024? Yeah, Back in like 2009, uh -huh. 2010, I used to work for this guy and a lifetime I, ago. yeah, left that company, went off, did bigger, better things. Uh, he reached out to me and said, Hey, Kevin, are you still doing the, the consulting thing? Um, we have a, a client that we're trying to help transition to someone else. And I think you'd be a great person for that. That's awesome. Uh, and it turns out it was a project that I worked on when I was at that company 12, 13 oh, years that's ago. That's awesome. And, yeah. and it's like, all right, mm -hmm. you know, I'm already uh, an expert in, <laughs> in this product right. because I built it. Uh, but yeah, that network, because I didn't burn bridges when I left. Mm -hmm. I didn't burn relationships. I was, you just be, yeah, just be a good person. And it helps tremendously. No matter how much it, okay. So I saw this, I love Jordan the Stallion. I think the guy makes amazing content. Um, and normally yep. I feel like he gets it right, but he did a stitch with this one, one guy who was talking about, well, they're not going to give me two weeks, so I'm not going to give them two weeks. And, you know, Jordan the Stallion was like, my man's on it. You know, um, these, you know, some of these people don't care for you and that you don't deserve, they don't deserve the care back effectively was the message. And I've actually contemplated like responding and basically saying, yeah, but here's the deal. The two weeks is the maintenance of a bridge that may serve you in the future. And, you know, if you just up and leave on somebody, um, it is, it, it, paints a bad picture and some, you know, you never know what influence the person you're working for may have on you later. Um, and so I look, I've been through some gnarly leave takings, um, and have yeah. wanted to burn the entire freaking house down on my way out and have not. And that is, that has actually been a very good thing for me. It turns out. So you never realize when you leave a job and when we talk about jobs, we're talking about skilled, skilled jobs, like you're yeah. maybe an office environment or something. But when you leave, you, if you leave immediately, no notice, you are not putting an impact on the million dollar corporation like you think you are. You're putting an impact on the uh, You're putting an impact on a person mm -hmm. and maybe a small group of persons yeah. who now have to figure out how to fill that gap that you're leaving behind. Mm -hmm. So it's not, so yes, you're impacting the, the organization, you're sticking it to the man, but you're really sticking it to just a person who waking up every morning going, I really don't mm -hmm. want to go to work today. This sucks. Yeah. And now you've made it suck that much more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and if you had any respect for that person that you're putting into a bad position, mm -hmm. you would just give them two weeks. Like, yeah. and in the grand scheme of thing, two weeks isn't a lot. And it's not like you're going to work during that two weeks anyway. Like the first thing that company's going to do is start offloading your responsibilities right. and start transitioning them to someone else or trying to find a replacement. Like you're going to have a pretty easy two weeks yeah. uh, when you put that notice in. Yeah. I mean, and, and uh, like you said, that is definitely kind of a skilled labor kind of a, a, a thing there. Um, but even, I mean, even in something that's, you know, physical labor and things like that, I have witnessed other people lose out on jobs because they worked for someone that knew someone. And so, you know, anyways, that's, uh, but that's a, when you have yeah, a job. We could, 
<laughs> so when you have a yeah, job. just I think the moral of this story is, you know, keep your network going and don't yeah. burn bridges unnecessarily in your yes. network. Um, if you if you have it within your control to be a good person, think of how yeah. you would feel if you're on the other side Absolutely. of it. Um, so we wanted to talk more about the diversification yeah. of of just income in general. And mm-hmm. this goes really well with what we talk about, multi-threaded income. Like mm-hmm. don't put all your eggs in the one basket. If that basket is a full-time job, don't put all your eggs in that one thing. Try to do yeah. other, other income-producing tasks. Mm-hmm. Um, and you come at it from a very different standpoint of, of the creator market. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, you just said at the beginning of our conversation, you know, it's scary to be on TikTok right now. Yeah. So why don't we start there? Okay. And let's just talk about why is it scary to be on a single platform? I think we have to kind of start at the very beginning, which is most creators, first off, don't realize that they're going to be creators. They just tend to go out and they do things and other people seem to like it. Um, I know that was the case for me. Um, It took me a while to find the thing that everybody wanted to see me do, but that ended up being (laughs) interviews. Um, And I was interviewing people in the FPV community. Um, I never started. Go ahead. What's FPV? Oh, sorry. First person view drones. So we're the, we were the folks, well, I don't fly anymore. Unfortunately, it's, it's expensive. Uh, but we're the guys that put the goggles on and we fly the drones as if we're in the goggles, the camera on front gets transmitted to the goggles and yeah, DRL. If you've seen that, um, actually you've seen plenty of FPV flights recently. If you've been to the movies, um, all these guys that I was interviewing are now filming, um, filming with FPV on these, you know, multi-million dollar shoots. It's, it's amazing. Um, wow. Uh, one of the guys that I am still, you know, still pretty close with, he does a lot of filming for Mark Rover. I mean, you know, there's, there's, uh, it's, it's a really cool sport and it is a really cool way to create. Um, but what, like I was saying is most creators don't realize they're starting out as creators. And then suddenly they realize I'm a creator. And what they don't realize at that point is you're a business. And so with a business, there's risk management, right? And so if you are a business and your business is solely dependent on one income stream, then if that income stream ever gets shut off, you're done. Or you're going to be scrambling while you're burning money. Um, And what, what is so hard for creators is that these people are really, really good at creating. Um, and, but they may not have the business skills that they need to be a successful business. And so what that ends up looking like is, you know, you have these influencers who are making brand deals and they're doing all these things, but the way that they're doing it is through TikTok. Their entire value stream comes through like TikTok. And so if you're a TikTok creator right now, who does not have a presence on an Instagram or a Twitch or, um, a YouTube or Facebook. I mean, you know, whatever other platforms you want podcasting, um, then the government is legitimately trying to talk about shutting down TikTok. Um, you know, there's more nuance to it than that, but the, the ultimate result is the way I make my income, the way that I feed my family or pay for my college or whatever is now under threat. And it would be way less scary if you could diversify that threat, right? Or diversify the risk that the threat has caused. Um, and, and that might look like being on different platforms. Um, and so, you know, it's, it is like, my heart really goes out to the folks that are dealing with this on the TikTok side. Um, it's not, I've never engaged in it as a creator or even a consumer. Um, I, I have always been leery of the connection to the CCP, quite frankly. Um, but also I do want to point out that I built the prototypes for a lot of the systems and I know how they can be used. Um, and so, um, it's funny advertising and surveillance, they really work well together. Um, yeah, all that to say, um, is not only is a single income stream, a risk, a single platform is a risk. And with the current creator economy, you're forced into platforms. And if you don't, if you can't operate on that platform, you lose the income that comes from through that platform. 
Are there any examples of where that has already happened in the past, I don't know, five, 10 years where people went all in on a platform and then that platform just went away overnight? I mean, there were definitely, there was Vine, it, which interestingly enough, that's what, that's what TikTok yeah. is, is Vine. Um, it's just yeah. done, the algorithm is what makes it so good. Um, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of creators that went all in on Vine and that thing bellied up fast, unfortunately. It was such an amazing idea. Um, you have, I mean, shoot, people that were on, that were building businesses on Twitter and then, you know, this dude, Elon bought it and, and effectively let the cesspool overflow the banks. And those folks can't be on Twitter anymore because like, there's a lot of, I think journalists is probably a good one. There's a lot of journalists yeah. right now that are looking for a home um, because they, their voice was so prominent on Twitter and now it's not even worth it to post because you get so much abuse. Um, and in a smaller way, I mean, there are, you know, uh, the whims of the YouTube algorithm are perhaps the most capricious force on the planet. Uh, I mean, like, go... <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the, something Neil I Patel says all the time is every creator has a moment in their creation journey where they talk about how much they hate the YouTube algorithm. But I mean, you know, you, YouTube will, will roll out accidentally roll out format changes and not even realize. It. And so if you go yeah. back about five or six years, might be even seven or eight, every video was typically about seven to eight minutes long. And then all of a sudden, every video became 10 to 12 minutes and then they got longer. And the reason was, is yeah. that YouTube allowed you to start putting ad breaks in, in different places. Um, and so if you were there and there's a lot of YouTube creators that have been doing it day in and day out, um, and they're retiring, they're like, I, I gotta be done for a while. Um, cause the, it is a grind. It's a mental psychological grind as well. Um, so. It, yeah. So, I mean, I, there's definitely places it's happened. Um, I think the one with TikTok though is probably the single most dramatic, um, and biggest. I mean, there's, there's, there, God, there's probably tens or hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue flowing through that platform in some way. And, you know, we're, we're talking about taking an ax to the base of it and that's tough. I remember pre, so around the time of pandemic, a little bit before mm -hmm. pandemic, a, a lot of folks in the coder community were really going to Twitch, like starting mm -hmm. live, live streaming on Twitch. Twitch was the place to go. Let's, let me hit my affiliate status so mm -hmm. I can start making money. Let me try to hit partner. And the, the going was good. Mm -hmm. Like if you got to that point, like I, I got payouts from Twitch a couple of times. Uh -huh. It wasn't a few money, but it was. Twitch. It was like, oh, I can. Surprising fact: Twitch has the highest CPMs of all the platforms. Really? Yes. And so, for for those that are not familiar with the term CPM, um, CPM is effectively uh, cost per milli, is what it stands for, which almost makes no sense until you realize that milli means thousand. Effectively, how much revenue can be generated for every thousand viewers? Um, okay. And or thousand listeners. And um, podcasts on average have the second highest CPM um, if there are sponsors and things like that. Um, but Twitch has the highest CPM. Um, and when I say it's the highest, I mean, you're talking $50, $60 per thousand views. Um, and really? uh, whereas podcasts are about probably anywhere from 20 to 40. Uh, and to put that in perspective, YouTube uh, the CPM average CPM on YouTube is around two or $3. That's interesting yeah. from a, from the Twitch standpoint, I had gotten the impression from folks that I knew that were mm -hmm. avid streamers on Twitch yeah. that Twitch had gone completely downhill and that it's, it's it was changed around. It's changed around again. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's probably why it's better to be on all the platforms, right? Yeah. Just so when it, does Evan flow? Do you remember Ninja, the Fortnite guy? I do. The yeah, Fortnite player. He's, I mean, he there was this big deal when he left Twitch, and he went to you. Got a mixer, did, a mixer, right? Was it, did he go to Mixer or YouTube? He ended up. On, I think he went to Mixer, I, didn't I he? I think he went to Mixer first. We'll have to. We could check, but um, 
yeah, I mean, he left Twitch to go somewhere yeah. else, basically, because he was going to get higher guaranteed CPMs. And then, um, but it didn't pan out. Like, YouTube made a big play for live streaming, and YouTube's okay with live streaming. Um, but, like, eventually he ended up back at Twitch, and a lot of the creators that left Twitch ended up back at Twitch. And some of that had to do with the fact that they were changing around the creator programs. So, yeah. But, um, yeah. What recommendation would you have for someone that's out there and they're, they're a beginner creator, mm -hmm. they're getting started and they're say only on YouTube or only on Twitch. What's, uh, what steps should they start taking to try to diversify? First off, don't quit your day job. Um, no, and I'm serious. Like there was a time where I was very tempted to, to quit my job and try to go all in. And I had some very smart people look at me and say, that is the dumbest freaking thing you could ever do. Um, and I'm glad that they did. And I'm glad that I listened. Um, at the time I didn't want to listen, but I did. Um, so yeah, don't, don't quit your day job. Um, the, the second thing is, um, if you want to start out as a creator, consistency is the single most important thing that you can do. And so what would that look like? Well, it looks like what you want it to look like, but it needs it. What it mean needs to be is that you have a presence, um, with you have a presence in the mind space of the people that you are creating for regularly. And so for podcasts, the answer is weekly, um, because weekly podcasts tend to do really well, um, for yep. YouTubers yeah, once, twice, three times a week. Um, for other, you know, for Instagram or TikTok, it's going to be, you know, at least once a day. Um, but you have to set that schedule and you have to stick to it. Um, the other thing is as you start out, explore, have fun, enjoy what you're doing. Something, you know, kind of throw everything at the wall in the beginning. Something will start sticking. And once that thing starts sticking, um, it will be the pigeonhole that you fit in. And then finally, yeah, you need to be on multiple platforms you, and you need to be thinking about revenue early. Um, and so what does revenue look like? Patreon, Mighty Networks, a subscription platform um, that allows you to have a consistent income because the, 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 bit, the best value about Patreon and Mighty Networks and some of the other platforms um, is that it is income that you count on. The, of, all of your other revenue sources will be spiky. Um, but yeah. if you know that I'm going to bring in a thousand dollars a month from Patreon, or I'm going to bring in, you know, two or 2000 or 300 or whatever, um, you can actually bank, on, you can bank on that money. Like literally, um, you can use that to pay for your necessities. Once you start getting to the place where you're thinking about brand deals or somebody approaches you for a brand deal. Um, the game is different at that point and you need to understand what your value is before you, I mean, the first few brand deals, sure, they're going to be small. People are going to throw peanuts at you, but eventually you need to understand yeah. how you, how much money you can command. So that was probably more than just a few, few starter tips, but. So does this apply to a certain level of creator? Like if I let's use multi-threaded income as an example like it's a fairly new pla new new platform right yeah. it's uh a, your episode 30 something right out of the catalog which is mature for a, like a podcast for a yeah. uh, podcast because yeah. it's past 10 episodes yeah but still relatively young trying to grow a listenership a viewership does something like multi-threaded income try to establish that that Patreon, yes. Mighty Network, that's something else that early. Yes. And if you don't have a Patreon grow. or Mighty Networks, Kevin, you no, need to have no. one. And on Well, I got homework now. Okay. And on top of it, you also yeah. need to paywall some of your content. Um, because how many podcasts have you listened to where at the end of the episode, they're like, okay, we're going to continue this conversation, but only yeah. for our, our, our patrons or only for the people that subscribe. And, um, the conversion rate on that hook is pretty high. Um, I, I did it recently for one, uh, for the, um, uh, cafe something with Preet Bharara cause it's just really good news coverage. Mm -hmm. And then there's another podcast I've been listening to called data over dogma. And, um, man, I'm really close to pulling the trigger on that one. 
just because I loved, I can't, I've literally consumed over a hundred episodes or so, and I'm just like desperately waiting every week for them to, to come out with a new one. So I, so I'm going to yeah. expose myself a little here. I have at least four podcasts. I pay, pay for the Good. additional like shows and stuff. Yeah. And it's mostly because I like the personalities mm -hmm. on the shows and yeah. I want to give a little bit more. And we're not talking a substantial amount of money. We're talking a buck or two a month yep. or a buck or two per show. Mm -hmm. And I'm in a financial position where I can do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt my bank. So something, something to consider, and this is, this will probably surprise you. Um, the, the, your patrons, your subscribers, that is not a transactional thing. That is not a transactional mm -hmm. relationship. It's tempting to think that it is. If I stop producing content or if I don't do this thing, um, then, uh, then they're going to, they're going to cancel and no, they won't. Most of those people are there because of you. They're there because of you. They do love what you do, but they also have kind of a parasocial relationship, um, with you where uh, they think yeah. they, they hear you talk, you're part of their lives and it's not, it's only goes one way. Um, and yeah. to, and, and this is to like, put this to the extreme, only fans creators, this is their business. And the funny yeah. thing is that, um, and like, I know it's, you know, it's tempting to think only, oh my God, only fans, like whatever. No, most of these people are fantastic creators. And now you may not love the content they create, but these, these folks are business minded a lot of the times and, um, but their content leaks immediately without fail, but they still have these yeah. giant creator bases. They have these fan bases and those fan bases are actually there because of the parasocial relationship. It's not about the need for the content. And so, um, and that is obviously like, that is the extreme, like there's biological imperatives that are getting employed there. Um, but like, yeah, even in those situations, a lot of those content creators could stop producing content and their fans might not go away. So interesting. Cause because, and I'll say this, All right. and if you ever hear interviews with any of these creators, most of them will say it is the conversations that they can have with me is what drives their membership. Gotcha. And there's a lot of opportunity, like multi-threaded income is mm -hmm. we, we have our discord and we have conversations yep. in our discord. And now, now I'm thinking, oh mm -hmm. man, I, I'm, I'm well, leaving money on the table. And I mean, yes. like with, with, you know, here's more, more nuts and bolts with discord. You can have a paid section for discord that yeah. ties directly to the patron, to the Patreon or mighty networks membership. And if they stop paying the membership, they, their access to the discord gets through. Exactly. And I mean, it, you know, it's a thing, but it's a privilege. Yeah. Too. So. All right. I have some homework for multi-threaded income yes. and. By the way, Kevin, I'm not, I'm going to recommend uh, against you starting an OnlyFans. like me, we are both kind of big men. And I believe that the addressable market's kind of small, just for the record, you know, Everyone's got a thing, right? Oh, this and is true. There, there are some <laughs> wild kinks out there, and I am not here to kink shame. Uh, I did We're have. Not shame. I was no. on one uh, YouTube show one time and convinced the entire audience that I was actually an OnlyFans creator, and that there was an enormous market for big men in uh, stockings and high heels. And oh man, it was it was some of the funnest times I've ever had. Man, I'm going to have to put an explicit rating on this episode. We have keep not talking. said anything um, explicit. All it's... right. <laughs> Mike, I want to, I want to stop talking about platforms and diversification. I want to talk more like financials, foundations and stability. Cause you said yeah. something very interesting at the beginning of the episode. And I want to circle back to it. And that you said when you had quit your job, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, when you lost your job, you didn't yeah. quit your job. You lost your job. Mm -hmm. Like. A lot of people out there, you felt you probably have that initial, like, uh, uh -huh. you know, I've lost my income stream. Yeah. And you said we, uh, you and your spouse, we thought I'm air quoting here. Mm -hmm. We thought we had three months of runway. Uh, I'd like you to expand a little bit on that. You said you thought you had three months. Did yeah. you 
have far less than that? Should you have had more? So, um, yes, we should have had more. The reason I say we thought that we had three months in the bank, um, is because it, we did not realize it would take us time to ramp down on our cost of living. And we also thought we could ramp down more than I think was reasonable. Um, and so, you know, that three months, um, was really more like two months to begin with, but then we did not account for Cobra and, um, health insurance is talk about go ahead. Cobra. I mean, let's imagine I'm not in the U S okay. And tell me what Cobra is. Okay. Um, if you are not in the U S then you are not uh, acquainted with the fact that the U S healthcare system is a freaking disaster. And dumpster fire. And one of the primary reasons that some people, including me for quite a while, do not go independent is because you don't have health care if you do, and you need to provide it yourself. Um, most health care policies are tied to employment and that, you know, you talk about sticking it to the man. That's, you know, I, I think that's a stupid statement to begin with, but that is a shackle in a lot of ways. Um, and so, uh, when you leave a job or especially if you're laid off, um, a lot of times you're given this opportunity to continue your healthcare policy beyond your employment, but you have to pay for everything out of pocket. And so what that means is that you're paying for your portion and you're paying the portion that your company was paying. And for us, that turned out to be $2,600 a month. And <laughs> We would not have gracefully accepted a $2,600 hit per month prior to my job going away. Um, and yeah. you, and after the fact, I mean, it's like, oh God, like we already, re we may have underplanned to begin with and wow, now we really did. Um, and so Cobra was, was our, was our biggest expense. It was, it was almost like a thousand dollars more than our house payment, right? We didn't yeah. have any other debt, thankfully. Um, but the only thing that was more expensive per month than Cobra was food. Do you under, underestimate how much food you consume in a given month? Um, no, we actually, we realized we like our, we, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I tell people if we wanted to eat Doritos and, and drink barrel water, if you know yeah. what that is. Um, yep. the, the sugar barrel water, God, this stuff was terrible. Um, I don't think they do that anymore. That was nah. like a nineties kid thing. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was definitely a nineties kid thing. Um, but, um, then we could eat for less than we do, but we try to feed ourselves yeah. and I have three kids for what's worth three teenagers. So, um, they are basically bottomless pits. Yeah. You said going, going into this, that you were uh, debt free mm -hmm. that uh, debt free, except for except your for house, house, your, your mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. How, how did that factor into your, I guess, mental state at the time you lost your job? Um, there was more peace in the two months after I lost my job than there had been for years. Um, we, when I got the, the, the job that I eventually got laid off from, um, we ended up um it had been tough but we paid off all of our debt there was like a car and then um we also saved up that three months because i was like i am tired of being in the position prior to that for what it's worth um the company that i was with called outlier was being acquired by twitter in april of 22 and this dude elon decided he wanted to come in and buy twitter and all of a sudden we weren't being acquired and we were now insolvent um oh no yeah so that's you know that's a Boy, that's an experience that leaves a mark on you. Um, and so as a result yeah. of that, we decided now we're going to go ahead and clear all our debt out and also make sure we have the savings. Um, if we had not had that savings, then the, then that time period and even the time period now, um, if we had, sorry, not the savings, if we had not gotten rid of all of our debt, uh, would have been wildly more stressful. I don't even, I don't even like to think about how stressful it would have been because contrary to what I thought I, I did leave and, and go try to get another job and it wasn't easy. I, the J O B didn't show up. Um, and which is why I had to create my own. 
and we were talking a little bit before mm -hmm. uh, we hit record. So this, is this really MTM goes to your come? Patreon conversation. Yeah, this is the mm -hmm. this is the stuff that we should be selling. Yeah, uh, is the yeah, before is, conversation. By the way, ending. if you're hearing this yeah. now, then it's going to stop right here. And if you'd like to hear it's, more, yeah. then our Patreon is Kevin dropped the Patreon list. Yeah. yeah. One dollar a month, you know, yeah. or one dollar per episode. No, blah, man, blah, blah, you blah. need to do at least um, three. Come on, you're worth it. At least three. You're worth it, oh man. yeah, don't sell myself short. Right. But we were talking, so we had a couple, you know, threads we were going with this, and one of them you had said that debt is anti income, anti -income. and I, I, I love that because mm -hmm. I, I don't think people appreciate, yeah, or they they rely too much on debt. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit more about what you meant by debt is anti-income? Um, so the, the, the situation is that, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Mathematically, debt is anti-income. You're trading future income for something now. Um, and that is what debt is. Like that's the actual, I think that's might be the actual definition of debt. Um, but the, but it is such a common way to do things nowadays that people don't even really think about it. Um, and what that ends up looking like is like, you know, everybody's worried about being, you know, having them, you know, the man tie you to the ground. Right. Well, yeah, you actually created all the shackles yourself and you put them on your hands and then you grab the, the hammer and put the nail in place. And then you handed the hammer to, to the man, right? Um, the reason that you're so dependent on the man a lot of times is because you are, you have so many payments to make and it's terrifying if you get to a point where you can't make those payments, you know? And, yeah. um, I mean, I know you do and, and we subscribe to Dave Ramsey and, and all this, these ideas that, um, that he puts forth and. I was having a conversation with my oldest son and he said, um, he said, dad, the game is rigged. He's 18. He's about to go off to college. And, and he said, I'll never have what you have. The game is rigged. And I said, you are absolutely right. The game is rigged. And that's why you don't play by the rules. And the rules yep. are that you go to college, you rack up a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000 worth of student loan debt which is not dischargeable. You can't bankrupt your way out nope. of student loans most of the time. Um, and then nope, they fix that loophole. Uh, yes. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> just on a side note, if they would just add that thing back in, the cost of college would come back down. Yeah. There's literally no risk in, in loaning that money. Side the point it makes me so angry. Um, but then you, you, you leave college and now you're an adult, so you need a new car. Um, eventually you're, you might, you, you need a new house, it turns out. And, but if you never start playing the game to begin with, then you're a hundred, 200, 300, $400,000 ahead of your peers. And, mm -hmm. you know, it is, um, the, I just cannot ex like. People, when people talk about wanting to be financially independent, when people talk about wanting to be wealthy, they're actually not talking about money most of the time. They're talking about freedom. I want the freedom to wake up and do what I want to do. That is why people want to be wealthy. And you are actively working against yourself when you take on debt actively. And, and, you know, the, the reality is that that requires sacrifice. Um, the reality is that it's not easy. And the reality is that it is harder now than I think it was for you and I, when we were coming up, um, you know, the world is a very strange, strange place all of a sudden. I remember being a 18, 19 year old, you know, getting my foot in the world. Yeah. And my first ambition was all right, I like to be as successful as my parents are right now yeah. and not really taking into consideration that it took my parents 25 20, years yeah. to yeah. get to that point. Yeah. And my, and I was so disconnected from all the financial hardships mm -hmm. that my parents went through. Um, 
because you and weren't there. <laughs> Quite I, yeah. possibly. And I was probably off to the side. Like I wasn't involved in that. And I never, never went without and always, you know, always taken care of. So like childhood was good for me. Um, and I remember yeah, being in, in college. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Going to college and having a part-time job. And eventually I got to the point where I was making what, like $18 an hour at a part-time job. Dude, I'm like, I you have, were I am, I am big stuff yeah. right now. For the record, then, that's it, probably it, like $800 an hour in modern money. Like, I just want to put that yeah. in perspective. <laughs> But like my first career out of a college, I was making 45, 48 grand a year. And I'm like, I have made it. I am so, I'm doing so well right now because I effectively was making good, quote, good money for mid 2000s, junior level, whatever, out of school. I've worked so hard to meet and exceed my, my parents position Mm -hmm. when I was younger and now I'm thinking about my kids and my, I, like I bought a house in 2009. Mm -hmm. Like I bought a house when it was a good time to buy a house Mm -hmm. and now is it, you know, a statistically horrible time to buy a house. It's a, it's a great time to sell a house, Mm -hmm. but you also need a place to live. So you, and you can't get one without the other. To tie that back to the debt conversation. Um, there, I was actually listening to, um, Scott Galloway recently. Um, I I think the guy has some really good ideas and he said something very interesting. He said the best time to start a business is when nobody else is starting it. And the same is true for just about everything else. The best time to buy a house is when nobody else is buying. Um, and the typically like in 2008, 2009, 2010, even we bought our house in 2012 and got a fantastic deal. Um, the people, you know, the only people that could move during that time period were those that were in a very cash flow positive situation. And most of the time for normal people, that meant they did not have a lot of debt. Yeah. And, and so when you don't carry debt, that also allows you to, to, to move faster in situations where everybody else is afraid. Let's, uh, keep good thoughts out there for our kids yes. who are going to be entering the workforce in the next decade or so and hope that is not as hard on them as I think it's going to be because I can't imagine being a teenager now preparing to enter the workforce and having that same ambition to meet and exceed what my parents had at the time I entered the workforce because that is a high Mm -hmm. that's a high bar to get over I'm gonna I'm gonna push back on that Okay. I don't want my kids to have what I have. And part of that is the systemic things that go into what I ha- to having what I have. When, when I did the, when I had the like sudden epiphany that if I had multiple income streams, I could be more independent. Um, yeah. One thing I realized is that my salary, which was a very, very good salary was also, it's a golden handcuff. Um, it would be so difficult to replace that income in a short period of time that it was feasible. It was unfeasible. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, but I wish that somebody had like poked me on the head when I was coming out of college and said, Hey, you don't have to go get the nine to five desk job. You can do this differently. And, Mm -hmm. you know, for my kids, I want them to have that freedom. Right. I don't want them if they want to like I tell my I, like my oldest son, I could totally see him going off for a couple of years to be the dive master of a sailboat in the Caribbean. Right. I want that to be yeah. a possibility for him. And if he comes out of college and he has a bunch of debt and he's forced into a normal nine to five job, that's not an option he has. And so while I do, I hope my kids are successful. Absolutely. Do I hope that my kids have a good roof over their house, over their head and have, you know, a family and things like that? I absolutely do. But I want them to be able to do it in the way that makes the most sense for them. And I'm not certain that the way that we did it is that way. 
Mike, we are coming to yes, about are. an hour, so we should probably wrap up. Um, thank you so much for thank coming you. on the show with me today. And we'll probably have to have you back at some point oh, to you. just continue this conversation Yeah, because it's always a good time. Well, thank you, Kevin. But with that, thank you everyone for listening. We will catch you next week on the Multi-Thread and Income Podcast. Y'all take care. Y'all have a good one. You've been listening to the Multi-Thread and Income Podcast. I really hope that this podcast has been useful for you. If it has, please take a moment to leave a review wherever you get your podcast from. And don't forget, the conversation doesn't stop here. Join us on our Discord at mti.to slash discord. I've been your host, Kevin Griffin, and we'll see you next week. Cha-ching! Cha-ching!